How can a brain full of squishy neurons represent knowledge? That's the challenge. And in this video, we're tackling it head on. This is the next installment explaining my disruptive approach to how your brain really works. And I guarantee you've never seen anything like this. Building on the information from previous videos in this series, I see this as the only plausible way your brain can store information. If you have a better theory, I want to hear it. If you're an AI professional, set aside what you know. The brain doesn't use backpropagation and it doesn't look like a large language model. And it has only a superficial similarity to a knowledge graph. In this video, I'll show you how information must be structured in the brain, and in upcoming videos we'll explore how this structure learns and enables human-level thinking. I'm Charles Simon, longtime AI researcher, software developer, and manager. Beyond AI, I've developed software for neurological test instruments and neural simulators. I created the Future AI Society to explore how neuroscience can inform smarter, more human-like AI. A lot of effort has gone into our open source brain simulator projects, which I'll be using throughout this series for simulations and demonstrations. Understanding how the human brain encodes knowledge is key to both neuroscience and the development of more intelligent AI systems. The challenge is not just storing facts, but representing the structure of relationships between concepts. In computational terms, this involves data modeling. In biological terms, it requires understanding of how neurons and synapses can form and retrieve relational knowledge. If you don't know how neurons and synapses work, I suggest you first watch the previous two videos in this series, then this one will make a lot more sense. Let's start out with my favorite simple example of a bit of information. Fido is a dog. Fido is a dog is a particularly useful example because it checks all the right boxes. We know your brain can store this kind of fact, People learn and recall such relationships quickly and effortlessly. Yet despite its simplicity, it's surprisingly complex under the hood. It's also an instance of a general form of knowledge, since almost everything fits into some kind of is a hierarchy, making it a foundational example for understanding how structured knowledge must be encoded in your brain. In future videos, I'll show you that with a few extensions, any kind of knowledge can be stored in a structure similar to the Fido is a dog statement. Not just most things, anything. So let's start with an overly simplistic approach which doesn't really work and then add to the model until it becomes useful. Let's start with two neurons, one labeled Fido and another labeled dog. At this time, I won't go into how these neurons might relate to real-world information, and keep in mind that these names are just labels for the convenience of this video. Biological neurons don't have labels, but without them, it's really difficult to explain how neural circuitry works. Notice that I've left some space between the Fido and dog neurons because I'll be adding a lot of cool stuff in there. To represent Fido as a dog, we'll start by adding a synapse between the two neurons with a synapse weight of 1. Here's why this single synapse doesn't represent Fido as a dog and what we need to do to fix it. Let's consider that both neurons have numerous other connections, but I specifically want to be able to query my network to ask, what is Fido? And have it contain the information that Fido is a dog. If I fire the Fido neuron, a spike will travel down the axon to the, a synapse, which will cause the dog neuron to fire, because the synapse weight is 1. As a simulation convenience, a small a equals 4 notation means that the Fido neuron is configured to fire repeatedly every 4 milliseconds, until I click it again. This is the maximum rate that a biological neuron can fire. 
If I click the dog neuron, it will also fire every four milliseconds, but no spike will go anywhere because biological synapses and axons are one-way components. We'll get back to this in a moment. One obvious problem is that this network will answer dog to any query about Fido, so it's not very useful. Let's change it so it will only respond to dog is a queries. Since we want the dog neuron to fire only if we're querying what Fido is, let's add a neuron and label it is a. We want to fire the dog neuron only if both Fido and Isa are firing. We can accomplish this with a fourth neuron, which I'll label A for convenience. I'll assign it a leakage rate and connect it to the Fido neuron via a synapse with a weight such that no amount of firing Fido will cause A to fire. In this case, a synapse weight of 0.6 is balanced with a leakage rate of 0.3, so that if I set the Fido neuron to fire at its maximum rate, neuron A will never fire. Now I'll add a similar synapse from the is a neuron to neuron A, and you can see that if the is a neuron fires while the Fido neuron continues firing, Neuron A will fire shortly thereafter. Lastly, I'll connect A to the dog neuron with a synapse weight of 1 so that dog will fire directly after A. Now, whenever Fido is firing and Isa fires, dog will fire. For those of you with a logic background, Neuron A is acting as an AND gate. You can imagine how these connections are made via Hebbian learning, as I described in the previous video, but we'll go into more details in the future. If you now hear that Spot is a dog, we can add a neuron representing Spot and another neuron labeled B and make similar connections so that if Spot and Isa are firing, dog will fire as well. You can see that we could add more dogs and more intermediate neurons indefinitely. We have billions of neurons available. We could also use identical circuitry to represent that dog is an animal, and an animal is a living thing, etc. Obviously, we can build a huge hierarchy of knowledge, but that's only part of the picture. If I were to ask you to name some dogs using this circuitry, you would be unable to comply because there are only connections going from the specific to the general. And because neurons are one way, there is no way to follow these connections in reverse. But I can add another intermediate, neuron C, with similar circuitry going in the opposite direction. And we'll also need to use a new relationship type which will be the inverse of Isa. Now, with the dog neuron firing, I can fire my inverse relationship neuron and both Fido and Spot will fire. English doesn't have a simple phrase to represent the inverse of Isa. What it really means is that the set of dogs contains the members Spot and Fido, but that's too much of a mouthful, so we'll call it has instance for now. Most relationship types have inverses, as you'll see as we continue. And as you learn things, your brain obviously creates these inverse relationships all the time without you thinking about it. Even non-human primates can do this. Perhaps even my cat can. While you might imagine a mechanism which explains how our brains learn forward relationships with heavy in learning, Automatically adding inverse relationships is trickier. I've seen no research which explains this, so in a future video, I'll explain how I see it must happen too. There's a lot more to knowledge than just the hierarchy. Most things have attributes, like dogs have fur and tails, which we could represent like this using a new relationship type, has a and it has the inverse relationship type is part of. As a further problem in English, has a has multiple meanings. 
Mary has a brain means that a brain is part of Mary. Mary has a computer means that Mary owns a computer. Within our network, we'll need to make sure we differentiate between these multiple different relationship types. So let's add the neurons to represent that dogs have fur and tails. That way, if we ask for the attributes of dog by firing has a, we'll find fur and tail. We can add a similar set of neurons to mean that spot has spots. And we can add the inverse relationship too and label it is part of. Now not only can we ask for the attributes of a dog, we can ask what has fur and a tail and learn that it's a dog by firing the is part of neuron. As a preview of coming attractions, we need to adjust the synapse weights based on the number of attributes. We can ask what has fur by firing just the fur neuron and the is part of neuron. If I contrive to fire a burst to the is part neuron, dog will fire, but it takes a little longer. I'll provide more details in a future video, but I think you can see that in addition to the hierarchy, you can add any number of attributes to every element in the network and then search by those attributes. You don't need all the attributes, you almost never know them all, but the more you know, the quicker the match will be found. As a further preview of coming attractions, watch this. This network can obviously tell us that Fido and Spot are dogs, but it can tell us some of the attributes of each. But if I contrive to fire both the is a and has a relationships at the same time, we can see that Fido also has fur and a tail. And we can even see that Spot has spots and fur and a tail. With this simple circuitry, we're already seeing the basics of attribute inheritance. This is huge and you'll learn why in future videos. I've shown how a few simple neural circuits can store virtually any kind of knowledge, and you can represent any kind of knowledge as relationships. We can add any number of things and attributes and relationship types, so this type of structure can be expanded indefinitely. As I mentioned at the beginning, this is the only possible way your brain can store this information. When you take into account how fast your brain is, even though individual neurons are a billion times slower than transistors, and that your brain uses less energy than my laptop, and that your brain can contain huge amounts of information and access it quickly, I challenge you to imagine any other solution. I've just scratched the surface here, and there are a lot of details to fill in, as I'll cover in future videos. Before creating such a list, I'd like to wait for your comments on how we need to expand this approach to be more brain-like and more biologically plausible. What are the holes? What brain research makes this implausible? Let me know. If you like this kind of content, be sure to like and subscribe and hit the notification bell. The YouTube algorithm isn't particularly supportive of unique content like this, so you are unlikely to be offered future videos unless you have requested notifications. Also, join the Future AI Society for free to participate in our online conversations about this content. And as always, thanks for watching.